Hello and good evening everyone. Um, it is late again and I am getting tired. But I have been listening to all the Meta Reality podcasts that are out as of today, uh, the 23rd of February 2012. And I feel like after, I think in total they run longer than a day, like 24 hours, no, like possibly even two days. Anyway, after listening to them for an awful lot of time, I feel like I would have to say a little bit about it, and then I'm going to shut up about this. Um, And I really don't want to talk about the podcast itself, but I want to talk about OpenSim, and so I guess this is more interesting for more people. Um, But the reason why I want to talk about OpenSim is that because of the podcast and the comments that have been left both on the podcast and by listeners, I have a feeling that there is a very strong widespread misconception about what OpenSim is and uh, what it's about. And um, I'm trying to wrap my head around how to respond to that because the problem we have is that most people don't even really know what Second Life is. And um, (coughs) even people who are in Second Life, to them it is a thousand different things and my second life might not be your second life and um, or someone else's second life some people love just having their own second life and forgetting about their real life and playing in this fantasy world of theirs and creating and living and meeting people there other people want to enhance it and bring their own virtual per- persona as close as they can to their real persona still others just want to do business or create or or play with things or are interested in the technology and 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 kind of um develop or just uh play around with it so To all these people, OpenSim can be different things, or it might not be the right thing. Um, But there are some misconceptions that are pretty easy to um, pretty easy to dismiss. Um... One of them is that OpenSim is a second life copy. OpenSim is not a second life copy in that it does not use any code from Linden Lab. Um, Indeed, uh, OpenSim had for the longest time a very strict policy of not accepting anyone's contributions if they had worked or looked at Linden Lab code during the past six months. So, um, and this um, policy has now changed to where contributors need to sign uh, a contributor's agreement that they will not put Second Life or Linden Lab code into the OpenSIM code base. And um, so, the whole part of this is that the whole point of this is um, to keep OpenSim free of infringing code that might um, make it uh, 
vulnerable to lawsuits from Linden Lab or people who might in the future have rights to the Linden Lab code, um, which basically could bring the whole um, project down. So the point of OpenSIM first is to make a second life platform, a uh, server-side platform that is free and remains free to use for everyone. And one of the points, or the, the main point to keep this free is that it is not based on in the lab code. So the other thing is, even though it does not use Linda Lab code, does it lo use Linda Lab's technology? Does it use? Did it steal the idea of Second Life? And um, it is part of OpenSim's mission statement, as far as I understand it, to have feature parity with Second Life. So that means. Uh, Second Life is kind of this um, blueprint um, that, or not exactly the blueprint, but um, the the model towards which OpenSim strives to be compatible. Mainly because Second Life provides a free and open source viewer software that is very useful in um, experiencing a 3D virtual world environment. It is the most useful software to date for this very task. So in order to be compatible with the Second Life viewer, OpenSim needs to be compatible to the way the viewer communicates to the Second Life server. Um, this is not so much, I this is just a, a design feature. <coughs> Now, um, this is the way I understand it, not stealing OpenSim's uh, Second Life's idea or technology. Uh, the viewer, the Linda viewer itself, is open sourced, has been open sourced by Linden Lab um, for the longest time. And uh, it is part or it is, it is central to the open source um, idea that things cannot be stolen because they don't belong to anyone. So um, the viewer itself is free to use by every, for everyone for any purpose. Um, This does not mean that OpenSim will forever and even currently always rely on the Second Life software and the Second Life viewer. Uh, in the past, there have been projects to make an OpenSim um, exclusive viewer that would use a different rendering engine and a different models. It would. It was um, the Relix 10 project which uh, used. Ogre meshes for their um, platform that run on OpenSim, but just use the different viewer software um, for their project. Right now, they have moved away from OpenSim and, and basically made their own platform. But that is one example of what you can do with OpenSim. OpenSim is a as much as Second Live is always called a platform, OpenSim is actually striving to be the platform that is a very open, very unspecific piece of software that could run any, any kind of environment as long as it meets certain criteria and uh, follows certain protocols. So part of OpenSim's strength is that this openness which enables people to modify it to their own needs which means that there is not the open sim the one thing that will um, be the same all over but there is the main code base the the core which is 
basically nothing but a backbone for all kinds of plugins and, and features and different things that can be implemented. Um, if we talk about OpenSim having, for example, voice, then um, the answer is no, the core um, software does not come with voice enabled. But um, through the plugin system, you can not only use the Vivox voice system, which Second Life uses, but several other voice uh, systems like um, Mumble Murmur servers to use in, in combination with your with your OpenSim platform. So, uh, or on the other hand, let's let's take economy. Um, does op OpenSim have an economy? The answer is basically no. The OpenSim core software does not come with an economic module. However, there are several third-party plugins that use several different virtual currencies or even one that just uses PayPal to, for, for transactions. All of these can be used with OpenSim. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a large box of building bricks. Um, and anyone can basically uh, make anything out of it suitable to their needs. There are certain standard flavors it comes on comes in. For example, I mentioned the um, OpenSim Core that comes in a standard configuration without any plugins. Um, the Diva distro has a certain configuration that is um, that comes with some Extras, for example, it comes with a web interface for um, users to um, register an account and uh, access their inventories through the web, or um, in a certain configuration from the start to enable hypergrid and uh, mega regions. There's um, Osgrid has its own configuration, which is primarily always based on the latest um, beta version, or latest um, testing version. Uh, and it's configured so you can connect your simulator to Osgrid. And uh, there are probably others. I don't want to bore anyone with um, just counting something. Um, so, op the point is, OpenSim is not one coherent thing overall. Um, the question is, is it better or worse than Second Life? And again, this question is not... First, it's not the right question, because OpenSim, even though it has some of the same features as Second Life and again aims for parity um, with Second Life uh, feature parity with Second Life um, has not the same goals as Second Life. OpenSim wants to be uh, a foundation platform where Second Life basically is a platform for um, Linden Labs um, business. So, the difference is, even though both things do the same, um, Second Live will always come in a certain s certain package, uh, mainly because its users expect it to be in a certain package, um, with all kinds of services built in, and frankly, I believe that this is a little bit more on Linden Labs plates than they will ever be able to perfectly deliver. But um, it will always come with, for example, um, people you know wanting good profiles, or people wanting voice, or people wanting um, groups, or discussions about how many groups they want and um, people wanting econo economy, a market uh, system. Um, 
all of these expectations I think have to be met to sell the product they do not necessarily be met need to be met by OpenSim the software that enables other people to uh, either have their own business built on on it or just uh, run their own OpenSim installation um, with this uh, unique set of software and play with it um, privately but um, for example it, it is not necessarily in OpenSim's interest and actually uh, might even be uh, problematic to the pro project to implement any kind of default economic system because then the project itself would on top of providing a server environment for a 3D space I have to worry about economic stuff that really um, isn't uh, a top priority and um, we probably don't even have exper experts um, to really give a, a good um, solution to this problem so I think it's wise to leave certain things out of the core um, software and if other people want that then they either come with their own solutions or we have third parties who provide a, a standard set of solutions that other people can implement um, on the other hand OpenSim already has step beyond Second Life by providing features that Second Life does not have um, I mean beside the fact that I can run my own Second Life environment on my own machine my own server my own computer or connect to other people's um, servers or computers there are certain things in which OpenSim actually delivers things that Second Life didn't or even can't deliver um, for a comparison I started up my OpenSim server here let's log in and have a look shall we okay <clears throat> here I am in my little OpenSim installation um, this is the loom for those of you who don't know it and um, actually it is now uh, Saturday um, a few days after I started the recording because um, halfway through I thought you know what what the heck um, I don't want to uh, come across as um, someone who you know just compares features and says everything's better here but um, so I really I really didn't intend of finishing it um, but then something else came along just yesterday where Linda Lab announced a change to its third-party viewer policy which effectively said that unless a feature is in the official Second Life viewer then um, no third-party viewer can have it um, a lot of people got upset about this and um, are afraid that this would stifle innovation for Linden Lab or for Second Life and um, the whole talk about OpenSim came up again <coughs> and um, bec just because there were some features mentioned that third-party viewers wanted to have or that may not 
be implemented into Second Life because of this or not anytime soon. Um, I, 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 I just have to go back to what I started before and um, draw a comparison here. You will soon see why. For once, um, let's talk about Sculpties. Sculpties in Second Life, I'm here in Second Life, are um, sophisticated meshes that have one little problem. They are, um, they look great, um, but when it comes to server-side physics, they are handled as a box. Every sculpt has is is treated as a physical object, um, like it was a box that would cover all of its um, vertices. This is called so-called bounding box. You can see this if you select the sculpt and go to the uh, stretch tool. Um, it will th the milky white frame is the bounding box. So. This means that if you, for example, walk on a sculpty in Second Life, you walk on the whole bounding box. You cannot just walk on one part, like for example this um, net here. Um, it would be logical to assume that you can only walk where the um, ropes are stretching to, but now you can walk on the whole um, object, which basically kills immersion quite a bit. I mean, I'm standing in in the air there. Um, OpenSim had addressed this, this issue and had for years now um, sculptees. I mean, the roof of my tower here is one single sculpt. And um, even though it also has a bounding box. This is the bound bounding box here. It is actually being treated as you would expect it to be handled by the server. I can walk up the side and around it just the way, just like it, it looks. This is something that Second Life hasn't addressed and probably will never address anymore um, with regards to sculpties. Another thing that came up is server-side wind light um, settings. What these mean is um, that you have a certain setting on your region and everyone who visits your region will be will have a wind light setting that you have defined for them. Um, the Phoenix Viewer has a nice hack for this um, where you can copy or put some code into the description field of your parcel and everyone who runs the Phoenix Viewer then will be displayed uh, the wind light setting that you defined there. This is nice, a nice workaround for a missing feature in Second Live. And, um, this also will very definitely be affected by the third-party viewer policy in disallowing it unless uh, Linden Lab comes out with a solution for this. And again, in OpenSim we have for a long time now a um, technology called LightShare, which was made by the great people of Meta7, that will allow you to change to set wind light settings for regions um, so that everyone who visits your region will be displayed the same wind light setting. Um, the cool thing about this is well, first of all, um, you have to have a viewer that supports it currently only imprudence, and I think the singularity viewer support this feature and um. You have to enable it in your OpenSIM configuration, which is really no big deal. Uh, the cool thing about this is this is a scripted uh, function. So you can have a tool like this cool wind light settings tool 
and you can edit the settings on the fly. You can change sun and moon position, colors. Um, probably the best way to see this is with clouds. Let's have some more clouds and let's move the clouds. You see that the clouds start moving. If I change the setting, they will move faster backwards or forwards any way I want. And the nice thing is this will be displayed in real time to everyone on your region who is um, who has wind light, uh, shared wind light settings enabled in their viewer. So if I switch over here to my to a second instance of uh, imprudence that I'm running and um, am logged into the account of my lovely partner here, Hello. she's getting just the same effects as I do. Here are the clouds I'm moving one direction. If I change it over here to make them move backwards, she will get the same effect on her side instantly. This is just another example of a function that already exists in OpenSim in a very good implementation and might be might or might not come to Second Live at any time, but, um, well, it's already there. It's no big deal, really, to have entries in your database that define wind light settings for you. And it's also no big deal to have scripted functions that will affect these database entries. Finally, another good example of a feature that OpenSim has in Second Live will probably never have is hypergrid. Hypergrid um, is the ability to teleport between OpenSim grids, which makes OpenSim um, decentralized in the first place and um, makes it a good example of a federated network of independent uh, simulators. Um, to do a hypergrid jump, all you have to do is um, have hypergrid enabled on your end and on the receiving end, the place you want to go to. Then you need the hypergrid address you want to go to. If we go to, like, let's say, Jocadia Grid, the address is jocadia.metaverseworlds.com-8002. Jocadia Metaverse Worlds. Dot com eight thousand two. You type this in map search and it will finally bring up the destination and then you just click on teleport like you would do if you teleported within the same grid. And um after the servers establish the connection, you will end up in your destination, things will start to res around you, and your name tag will show your name and at the and then the name of the grid you came from to display um, to other people that you are a hypergrid traveler. Um, <coughs> Also, this changed third-party viewer policy kind of proves my point about why why it's not a good idea to have one company control the metaverse. Um, because sometimes the interests of the people, the users, uh, and the proponents of said metaverse and the interest of the company itself and their um, financial interest collide and you get policies like these which for some reason stifle innovation on 
on the open source uh, viewer developers side and um, as a few people already ex suspect it, I can't see open source developers who are not paid for what they do they do it out of love and because they like to code I cannot see them jumping through all the hoops to get their one feature that they've been working on um, approved by the lab. They might just put it in a viewer and have people on OpenSim use it where nobody needs to approve it and everybody can decide whether or not they want to use it for themselves. Um, so, um, the bottom line of this rant is that OpenSim is probably a better solution to those who want a metaverse. It is for simply political, let's call it political reasons. Um, because it is decentralized and nobody controls it really, a better solution than a centralized and uh, company controlled software like Second Life. This is not to say that Second Life does not have its uses. It's just to say that those people who yearn for an interconnected metaverse um, should not or should save their energies um, for, um, for should save their energies um, that they're wasting by trying to get Linden Lab to bring that about because I can't see that happening really um, instead try out OpenSim um, at worst, you can't do not like it. At the best, it is just what you ever wanted. Thank you very much.